Here you are. I started the recording. I'll go through the, the Linux Foundation and Trust Policy. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors and is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with the applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to missing agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company council, or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrea of the Grove of the firm of Gessner at the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. So, welcome everybody to this new meetings, second one in row in 2021. My pleasure to introduce you to my friend Ido Wakinde from Lagos, Nigeria. And will, you know, it will introduce us what to, to not look on what's going on in terms of blockchain industry in Western Africa with a particular focus on Nigeria. So for me today is as a very important meeting and I'll leave it to on to Idu step in and to detail on what is going on in the, in the continent. Idu. All right, thank you, Andrea. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the privilege. Um, I look forward to uh, uh, many more uh, conversations like this. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to quickly say that this is going to be an informal chat. Excuse me. <laughs> Probably need to minimize those. Uh, 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 I'd like to say quickly that this is going to be an informal chat. It's going to be more like a like an interactive discussion, you know, uh, rather than a a, a monologue. Um, the purpose and the purpose of this meeting is just to share share perspectives and discuss opportunities, challenges, and generally just you know take an overview, a 10,000 foot overview of the trade finance landscape in Africa, as well as the efforts so far to uh, resolve some of those challenges through digitization, AKA blockchains, AKA hyperledger. Um, you know, so, so, so that's pretty much um, uh, what we'll be discussing today. I have a few slides here, and I will start to share in just a moment. <clears throat> so, so I'm having a technical glitch with my PowerPoint. It's not coming up. Um, Andrea, could you open up yours? You know, just in case as a backup. Uh, you want me to share it? I well, can do that. Yes, if you, you haven't me? already, could you share? Um, uh, I think I'm gonna have a RAM crisis on my hands. I, I can do it. I can do it if you want. I've got it on my uh, here. I can do it here, oh, Julian. Right. You want me to do it? Okay, yeah, so I have it open. so it's open now. Can you see it? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can see. It. Okay. So, so you tell me when to move forward. I think we've done. So I'll take you through where we are. We're basically, come on, present, presenter mode. Why is it doing that to me? There you are. And we're going one, two, three, four, we're here. An informal chat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to introduce myself as a, as a retired coffee junkie. Um, and by that, I, I refer to my hands-on technical programming days. I started off my career some 20 years ago as a programmer. Um, used to write uh, in languages that are now called dinosaur languages. Uh, but 
um, over the years, I have evolved into something of a product manager sometimes, engineering manager sometimes, VP architect sometimes. You know, you know, at the end of the day, someone who manages your techies and who serves as a bridge between business people and tech people. Um, so uh, that's pretty much about me. I currently run Boolean Labs and we're a digital co-creation firm. Uh, can go to the next one? <clears throat> All right, so, um, you know, you know, if I, if I were to say the word Africa, okay, <laughs> I, I, I mean, quite a number of, I'm aware that quite a number of images are subconsciously associated with that word all over the world, you know. People have all sorts of images about Africa. Um, I have lived and grown here all of my life. Uh, I'm about 40 years old. And uh, I, I kind of know that there are different aspects to Africa, okay? There are the, there are the really, really, really hard hit and, hard hit and, and, and seriously affected regions. And then there are the other parts of Africa that are, quite frankly, in my opinion, some of the most beautiful places on this planet. And I think I've been around quite a bit. I, you know, I think I've been beyond short of Africa quite a bit. Um, so it's, it's always interesting for me, especially at opportunities like this, to throw up the word, or rather throw up the question, what do people, what image comes up in people's minds? So um, uh, Andrea, Julian, I don't know if this is in tandem with the format of these meetings, but can we just get a few feedbacks from audience about what the word Africa conjures before I go? I mean, probably with 30 seconds or one minute. Can we do that? Okay, so can anyone, can anyone just, you know, tell us, can you just tell us what you think about Africa? When you hear Africa, what comes to your mind? I think Julia hear many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously uh, Egypt, South Africa, the rugby, uh, Enormous, you know, as you say, that you know, Africa has always been for people. We've seen it from famine, right, to to boom, to, to disturbances, to mineral wealth. Mm -hmm. It's it's it's, and it is geographically. I don't think people realize because the way the map is look, it's actually an enormous continent, right? It's a very very big place. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Um, anyone else? Um, and in, and in three seconds, if there's no one else, I'll just go on. Okay, so um, I often find, right, thank, you, thank you for that perspective. What I often find with uh, conversations like this is that uh, people usually, probably the most common image, right, that people associate with, with, with Africa is the, is the uh, well, you know, is that place that has the least modern civilization, modern civilization or modern uh, civilized infrastructure in place. Essentially what that means is the place with the least sophisticated, the least developed cities and stuff like that. While that may be true, you know, because that is actually true, Africa has suffered a huge, um, you know, uh, a crisis of leadership over the last few decades where people have, uh, uh, leaders have skipped on developing the needed infrastructure that you know, is required to move the continent forward. But you see, you can see that situation as either a problem or an opportunity, okay? Um, and, and it's entirely a matter of perspective. The fact that millions of people do not have access to, for instance, electricity, which is basic in every other part of, well, almost every other part of the world, is actually an opportunity for whomever wants to volunteer to take up the challenge to solve the you know, problem of electricity. Rinse and repeat for identity management, rinse and repeat for intercontinental trade, rinse and repeat for e-commerce, logistics, and all sorts of things, okay? So that's where, that's where I come in, okay? And I'd like to show us a few examples of how, when we do tell into trade finance specifically, we see how even though they look like challenges, they're actually opportunities because they are problems that are very, very solvable given the tools, the technology tools that are available in, you know, 
in, in 2021. Uh, the last point I want to say there is, uh, think about it, you probably will not be able to get the opportunity to affect as many lives or as many people, as many swords of people, you know, anywhere else in the world. But uh, please move on. All right. Okay, so if you look at, um, uh, it's often said in global trade forums and, and discussions that uh, Africa alone uh, contributes less than 5% of global trade volume. You know? uh, and a few reasons, you know, the experts, a few reasons have been thrown up for that. Uh, one of them being low productive capacity, as we said, there's no infrastructure and therefore there's no production. You know, we, large, we essentially literally skipped out on the industrial revolution. That's just what it is. Even agriculture that is just starting to wake up, you know, people are just starting to wake up to mechanization and farming and stuff like that and automation. Um, the second point is high market access barriers. So it's usually quite difficult for um, local players, local African players to access global markets, right? For all sorts of reasons. You know, uh, sometimes some of them, uh, some of them protectionist by the destination regions. Sometimes some of them, you know, you know as a result of uh, factors on the continent. Third point there is a high perception of risk by the rest of the world. And that's why I asked the question earlier uh, about, about, about the image uh, that comes up. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, but there is one question that is usually not asked, okay? And that question is, or rather, I'd say there's one factor to the low, the, the abysmally low volume of trade finance that occurs in Africa that is usually not uh, reckoned with. And I, and I, and I, and that single factor is access to trade finance. Uh, for, for all sorts of reasons, for a myriad, for a million and one reasons, it, it just is the case that local players on the African continent have significant challenges accessing trade finance. Um, um, I don't wanna jump the gun, but as we go on, uh, uh, we will see how, um, how many of those, those things, uh, please move on how many of those things are come together. So this is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, the contribution is less than 5%. You can see how Europe, Asia, and, and, and North America are, are dominated. Let's go, uh, next slide. Um, now, if you consider, if you look at the data, you see, you see that, you see the trends, the trends tell you that um, generally speaking, there's a huge volume of trade that is going on in Africa that is not passing through the banks, okay, or through the structured financing mechanisms, aka banks, all right. Uh, so um, uh, uh, from this data set that, I, that, that we're using uh, uh, for this discussion, it's clear that, you know, approximately only 31% of total African trade was bank intermediated. What that means, technically speaking, is that for the rest, for the, for the remaining 69% or 70%, it has to be that those companies, either, either it is a, a local company with a foreign client, or it's a local company with another local client, it essentially means that those clients, neither the, neither the service provider nor the service consumer are enjoying bank finance or third party financing. And what that means is that both of them are paying out of pocket for their expenses. Out of pocket traditionally automatically also points to things like uh, uh, cash hand risks, you know, and stuff like that, you know, uh, um, um, uh, lack of lack of an opportunity to enjoy the benefits of third party financing and other stuff. So um, uh, that's the second, that's the second uh, trend that is observed with uh, non-bank intermediated trade finance in Africa. Let's go on. All right, um, you also observe that when you analyze the data again, that approximately 60%, there's a disproportionate uh, 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 percentage of trade finance uh, transactions, even, even, even those within the bank intermediated ones that are skewed towards a certain crop of clients. So, you see, so if you look into the if you look into the data, you see that 
60% of the entire data set for all banking and related trade, trade, trade finance transactions are carried out by the top 10 banks, okay? The top 10 clients of those banks. What that means is that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a mini oligopoly, right? You know, so essentially there is a huge percentage of enterprises in Africa, all over the continent that are not accessing, you know, trade finance, right? Yes, a bank may selfishly say, if 60% of my transactions are with these particular clients, Pareto principle, I will focus on them. But that doesn't develop the ecosystem, doesn't develop the entire continent, doesn't develop the micro. It makes sense on the, sorry, on the macro. It makes sense on the micro, but it doesn't make sense on the macro. So uh, the argument I'm trying to make here is, on average, only 28%, on average, 80%, even though 80% of enterprises in Africa are, 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 are SMEs, um, uh, they only account for about 28% of bank trade, by, trade, trade finance transactions. So uh, uh, if you look at that diagram, you see that on the left, you have the large Pan-African corporates, you know, the big companies, SAB Mila, uh, uh, the big companies, Dangote, and so on and so forth. On the on the second, in the second column, you have the international companies, okay? Because they are international, they have foreign headquarters, they have lines of credit, they have ways of you know, moving money around, uh, or rather access to fund, access to money. But the regional SMEs are the ones that are really, really bearing the brunt of this problem, because even though they are 80% of the, of the landscape by volume, by quantity, they are not able to access. So many times they are, they are performing under capacity, or they are, you know, taking unnecessary risks, you know, that they that they don't have to. In a few, in a few, in, in a few more slides, we we'll see how some of these factors, what are the drivers behind these factors, and how we can mitigate them. Can we go on, please? All right. Okay. So um, perhaps you know, you know, the most interesting slide here is the is the gap. Okay, the opportunity. Um, what is the observation has been that. There's a there's an there's there's an approximate ninety to one hundred and twenty billion dollar opportunity, which essentially points to trade finance transactions that are not that are either you know being passed on or are not being optimally operated or being optimally executed. Essentially, what that means is you know like the ones I mentioned earlier, where either the service provider or the service consumer, or both of them are paying out of pocket for their expenses if they have all the eligibility criteria to qualify for third party financing. The way are they doing that? That's the first thing. And another subcategory of that would be those that are not even captured, right? Those captured in the, in, the, in the net in the first place. Those that, those that don't even have, you know, any kind of relationship with, um, with, with, with structured financing in the first place. And then the third category will be unexplored, undiscovered opportunities, either passed on because pa passed on by, by, by external parties that want to transact with Africa but, don't, but can't find any trusted party, or passed on uh, by, by, by local players because it doesn't look like it's worth their, an, an investment of their time, effort, and money. You know, so uh, people have, uh, experts, I'm not an expert, but experts have, come, have, have esti estimated the size of this market the entire, across the continent to be about 90 billion, be, between 90 billion at, the, at the, the worst case and about, two, and, and about $120 billion on the, in, uh, 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 on the best case. Um, next slide. All right. So this is, a slice, this is a slide that talks about the reasons for these um, these, these, this gap, this huge gap, All right? Um, and again, um, Pareto principle, right? Uh, start with, start with, start with the, start with whatever fact, whatever factors are, are responsible for the greatest percentage of your outcomes, results, or improvement efforts, remediation efforts. So, if you look at the greatest segment of this pie, that's the green segment, which is client worthiness. If you think about it, what? What, 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 what contributes to client worthiness? Client worthiness essentially is record keeping. Client worthiness essentially is verifiable records, okay? Uh, um, how do you, uh, um, uh, credit, creditors, okay? Essentially financiers, third party financiers, banks, and other, and other finance institutions, 
essentially are able to make, and, and, and it's a global practice, this is not exclusive to Africa. All over the world, financiers are able to make judgments, informed judgments about the worthiness or not, or otherwise of a particular aspiring client, you know, someone who's applying for some type of credit, essentially based on records, either it's past historical financial performance uh, transaction records, or it's uh, some kind of confidence score gotten from other records about that person, immigration records, um, you know, other societal factors and stuff like that. You know, but at the end of the day, client credit worthiness is essentially a derivative of how much data or, or records are available about the particular person in question or the particular entity, whether it's a person or a business in question. So if you, if, if you really think about it, if you want to, if you want to, if we want to eliminate the, the, this huge uh, factor that represents that six percent of this gap, which is client credit worthiness, then maybe we should start to think about, first of all, ensuring that there are records, and secondly, ensuring that those records are valid and verifiable. Uh, that would, that would go a long way, in my opinion, to reduce this thirty-six percent. Perhaps if we can reduce it by. 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, then we've done a good job, okay? Uh, 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 we're, we're well on our way. So that's the first point there. That's client, cre client credit worthiness. The second point is insufficient collateral. All right. Again, pointing to, pointing to, pointing to the huge um, deficit of infrastructure that we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, um, what has happened over the decades is that successive, you know, successive governments, successive, you know, uh, 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 leadership regimes all over Africa have failed to establish systems of record, asset, systems of asset records that can serve for collateral purposes. Okay, I'll explain. Um, um, I'm an, I'm a I'm a, I'm a startup invest. Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a startup mentor and advisor to um, to a particular company that is right now digitizing the entire real estate in Nigeria and by extension Africa. Essentially, what that company is doing is that we have they've discovered okay because I'm an advisor okay they've discovered that there is a lot of value right that is trapped in real estate. There are a lot of landowners in, let's, let's even just focus on Nigeria. There are a lot of landowners in Nigeria, right? But they can't access credits because technically speaking, when they walk up to a bank, the type of asset that they own, even though it could be worth whatever it could be worth, is not on the official list of approved collaterals, right? So a huge part of, again, because Africa has not been um, again, because those systems of records you, you know, that I mentioned earlier have not been put in place, it becomes difficult for local players to access sometimes generational, if they use the word wealth, okay? Yeah, because it is wealth that's, that's been handed over, you know, you know uh, huge, huge, huge swaths of capital that are available uh, 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 and can be used as collateral, but it's just not available for use because uh, the credit systems do not recognize those assets. Um, um, so um, the, the takeaway from that, my suggestion, my, my proposition, my, my ask for that is that we work, you know, to close the gap in the digitization. Of course, it must also be accurate. There must also be a very high level degree of accuracy. Digitization of non of traditional or, or rather non-traditional asset classes that can be used as collateral. And I think that if we take care of that, um, we would have done a good, would have beaten a huge chunk out of this 30%, you know, um, that's, that's, that is a driver of the, of the 120 billion gap. So if you look at my reasoning, my reasoning is, if we can take out 50% of this 36% and take out another 50% of this um, 30% and take out another 50% of this 7%, we would have done a good job to have reduced this 120 billion gap because, hey, you know, you know that's Pareto principle, you know. So um, um, uh, uh, let's just go to the next slide, okay? So that I don't, I don't, I don't take too much of our time. All right. 
Okay, so so um, uh, given all of that background, um, um, I thought that it was necessary to um, highlight a few use cases, right? A few use cases of trade finance in Africa, trade finance projects, trade finance implementations, instances, you know, uh, 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 adoptions all over the continent. And, you know, just for the sake of uh, brevity, uh, I have only three listed here. So I have it so broken down into two sections. There are those that are foreign, foreign built and deployed locally, which are on this slide, there's SKU chain. Uh, you know, uh, 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 I think it was built in partnership with the UN. Um, and then there's fast track trade, which is also um, uh, active on the continent. And then there's IBM. Oh, I have trade lens here. I thought that was WeTrade. So we have trade lens and then there's WeTrade, which are uh, uh, both of which are IBM, IBM affiliated. Next slide. The second, um, the second set of use cases are locally built um, trade finance solutions, again, built on Hyperledger, but you know, again, like I said, built locally and deployed locally as well. Uh, so Studium is a, is, a, is a solution, is a trade finance solution that is built by a company that I'm also affiliated with, based here in Nigeria. And essentially their mandate that they, <laughs> Their mandate is to digitize the entire workflow of trade finance from uh, letter from M letter of credit, the entire process. You know, it's a huge paper-driven process. They just want to turn that process into a highly digitized, highly referenceable, highly um, um, trustworthy uh, bank repository of information. Uh, second, there is TradeX. TradeX is also in Nigerian. Um, a trade finance solution, um, um, uh, uh, and it's been it's been adopted by one of the biggest in Nigeria. Payable is South African uh, as well. So can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> All right. So um, on this slide, I have here a few you know talking points. Um, again, I thought, I, I had imagined that this would be much more interactive. I guess we'll have an opportunity for questions uh, a few slides when, when, I, when I conclude. Um, but essentially, there are a few, there are a few uh, opportunities that have been identified. Uh, Cointelegraph, you know, that identified that between the Middle East and Africa, uh, blockchain spending is likely to, I forget the exact figure now, I don't have my browser open right now. But the exact figure uh, 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 of blockchain, is, blockchain spending is set to, um, you know, really, really, really surge by 400% in essentially two years. Um, uh, the next, the next article there highlights WeTrade, which I mentioned earlier is an IBM solution, and it is now being used for open account trades. Uh, 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 and if you're familiar with trade finance, open accounts is a type of trade finance transaction um, for, for, for open account trade financing, trade finance transactions. And um, uh, the third one there is a general overview of, of blockchain, the blockchain space and, and uh, of the trade, the trade finance space and how blockchains are being used to either drive up efficiency, reduce costs or improve profits for the players in that space. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Can you go to, is there a next slide? All right. <laughs> All right. So um, <laughs> I just put this here to say um, that's my overview. Um, and if there are any questions, I, I, can, I can take them now. OK. Thank you, Edu. That was really great. I mean, uh, you pointed out a few very interesting uh, uh, problems, you know, that as a trade finance specialist I've been facing all over my career. And mainly, uh, you know, the trade finance gap, which is huge, you know, according to everybody's sources. Um, we have to find new models to, to fill in the gap. And of course, you know, the lack of information down in the continent is also a problem. If you use traditional methods, 
methods that are being you know used centuries uh, nowadays. So I'm wondering how blockchain could step in in order to to fill in the gap. Uh, I don't pretend. I mean, I don't aim at giving an answer today, but you know, let's uh, try to understand what can we do in order to to, to solve this problem. Uh, Africa, for me, according to my experience, which is quite large in the continent, main problem is. Okay, lack of information. It's a highly specialized market, namely in commodities, and strictly connected to other core areas of the world that you pointed out, Ido. And namely, is the Middle East. Think about how many Lebanese people do live and work in Western Africa as a whole, and also strictly connected to Nigeria in particular, with, with India, with the Indian subcontinent. So don't think of Africa as just the continent. But think of Africa as a reach towards other areas of the world. And, you know, I'll leave them to maybe Thomas Croissant wanted to, to ask you something you, he, he sent me. I don't know whether he's still over there. If he wants to, to, to give his own opinion on this respect. Thomas. It's not there. And longer. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, well, Thomas is trying to find a way to speak. Um, can you click yeah. on your mute on your mic? That should unmute you. Yeah. yeah. There it is. He looks muted. Yeah, it looks muted, uh, but I cannot unmute mm -hmm. him. Uh, okay. Okay, let me try and let me try and answer his question that was typed in the. Okay, he said he has a problem with the speech. Maybe his mic has a problem. But let me try and answer the question that he typed in the chat window. I was just responding to it. Uh, so Thomas said, uh, "So true. The problem is for financial institutions to find a way to take decisions based on new data and build predictive models rather than empirical models." And I couldn't. I mean, I mean, being a champion, being a promoter of emerging technologies, uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, data science, myself, machine learning, myself. Um, that is just spot on. Almost that is 100% spot on. Uh, there's, there's absolutely uh, no reason why um, uh, banks and other financial institutions in 2021 should be evaluating, um, you know, uh, 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 credit applications using traditional 1970, 1950 criteria. Um, right now, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, um, I think that the greatest class of, the most promising class of, of um, fintechs right now are those that are doing exactly what you've just mentioned here, which is taking an alternative perspective, an alternative approach to how the banks on the other traditional financial institutions have traditionally done things. So instead of thinking about, instead of thinking about um, credit worthiness and the other things that they do using the usual traditional criteria, uh, you have all these fintechs that are taking, that are onboarding uh, people that don't have banking accounts and therefore no traditional credit worthiness. And they are able to arrive at some kind of credit score using you know, a, a, a non-traditional criteria as well whether it's a network, whether it's their phone telecoms network or some other network or some other asset that they have. Uh, uh, for instance, there's a, there's a startup here based in Lagos, there's a FinTech startup here based in Lagos that I consulted for in the middle of last year. And essentially what they're doing is that they are trying to turn um, the assets that Nigerians love so much and, 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 and attach a lot of emotional value to, which are their cars. They're trying to turn those things into collateral. So rather than ask you for your credit history or your bank statements, they ask you for your ownership details for the cars that you own. Because in Nigeria, there is a sentimental attachment to vehicles or to cars. Nobody in Nigeria wants to own a car and lose that car. The, the reasons for that are another conversation, uh, another conversation inside. But you know, if you can, if 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 those traditional players can think creatively about, hey, there's a huge sort of people that we're leaving out again. You know, what, what can we 
think different, how can we think differently about how we are looking at them? I think that that's the core of Thomas's point. If I'm, if I'm wrong, please correct me. And I think that that's a very good point. Thank you very much for raising that. Uh, Thomas was also adding a few notes. You know, he, he, he said, uh, hold on, what, what I would love is it, uh, to see lenders invest in finding ways to finance SMEs without a long credit history, rather than asking SMEs to become European look like. That's a good point in my vision as well, you know, finding new ways. You also have to get a, a sort of legal infrastructure, and then that is I'm asking you right now. You know, in Europe we have the GDPR. Uh, we have so many things going on in terms of data production for both consumers and companies. How is the stages? I'm, I know the picture in Africa is more fragmented maybe than in Europe, but you have the European Union basically. What is the situation? actually in, in Nigeria, maybe as one of the most populous countries and the rest of the continent you do. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good, that's a very good one. Um, so Nigeria does have a, um, 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 and I don't want to paint it as a copycat, but we have our own version of the GDPR. It's called the NDPR, you know, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as you might guess, uh, Nigerian data protection regulations. And essentially it lays out the guidelines. It's still young, it's still relatively young. It's less than two years old, just or, or, or perhaps about two years old. Um, and it's, it's, it essentially lays out the guidelines for how organizations, you know, just like GDPR, exactly how organizations who one, collect, two, process, three, store data, uh, are to behave or are to their obligations to the owners of that data, the people from whom they collect that data, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it does protect both the play, uh, uh, both categories of players that you mentioned, both the, both, the, both the data collectors, both the service providers and the consumers as well. Uh, so so, so I, can, I can speak of that for Nigeria. I can't exact, I don't exactly know if I can, uh, I don't know what occurs, you know, uh, uh, in other countries, but I know that Nigeria has an NDPR, which is a Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. Thanks, you do perfect. Uh, any other questions from the attendants uh, in this respect, or any other subjects that we would like to, to go deeper into? Julian, what do you think? I, I think it's very interesting, right? I'm no expert on, on Africa. <laughs> so I, I think it's more in Asia Pacific, but yeah. Uh, so what kind of time scale do you think that um, uh, you gave about the, 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 all the challenges, right? Uh, and of course, I see a lot of modernization. Of, I mean, from a China perspective, we see continuous modernization, right? Uh, of, of Africa, right? And Africa also. I think it's the second largest continent and the second largest population in the world, right? It's a very large place. Um, so, 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 do you see um, uh, increasing adoption of, of of a leaping frog? You know, they have this opportunity to leapfrog technology. Do you think that's going to happen in this area, or is it? Um... Okay, okay. So, I like your question. Um, uh, I like I like that question. It forces me to to be creative. It forces me to be imaginative. All right, and I like you know, as, as Einstein said, imagination is better than knowledge. Um, yes, I believe that you know, even though the word leapfrog sounds slightly ambitious, okay, but I do believe that yes, indeed, Africa can leapfrog you know, you know, that this huge infrastructure gap, okay, and and join the rest of the world at least somewhat. Um, by taking a set of very, very deliberate strategic uh, steps. One of which is, the, is a tunnel focused, uh, uh, you know, attention on digitizing records 
from identity records to you know you know financing records to you know uh, uh, land transaction records you know to customs and all, and all, and all those things uh, uh, a huge part of the a huge part of the huge corruption that occurs that has occurred in Africa you know over the last few decades is because people are able to hide under the fact that records typically generally do not exist okay and and where those records exist they are sometimes you know uh, not tamper proof which leads me to the next point to the next part of your question and in digitizing those records across many verticals across many spaces across many sectors we must also be mindful to use tamper proof technologies like blockchain okay which will give a high degree of confidence in the data as it, as, 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 as it comes in so that people can safely transact with the institutions that are publishing that data, knowing that the probability of uh, tampering with the inherent data in those systems is very, very, very minuscule, if not, in, if not entirely impossible. So yes, I believe that, you know, the two parts of your question, yes, I believe that we can leap from. Um, uh, uh, number one, yes, I believe we can leap from. Number two, we, we can only do it if we deliberately uh, discard our old affinity for not recording things. We must, we must definitely start to write things down and record them in, in, in digital systems. Thirdly, we must leverage technologies like blockchain. And this is where Hypologia is an excellent choice because hey, you know, mature technology, uh, get up to production in, in, in short as possible time. And, you know, um, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. It's good. It's, uh, thank you for your insight, definitely, um, of what, what is possible. So any other questions from anybody else? You can ask questions via, uh, via the chat. I think you've given so much information. You're, everyone, everyone's... <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else from Africa have a different opinion? So that's not a good yeah. thing. Huh? I, should, I should have held some back. That's not a good thing. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Mind. And where do you see in Africa the, the most opportunity? So you're in Nigeria. Is it West Africa? Obviously, there's things happening in East Africa as well. So whereabouts, because most people, you know, where, whereabouts is the opportunity or all across Africa? Where, where do you see the greatest opportunity? You'd probably say Lagos, Nigeria. Well, well, yes, um, yes, I'm slightly sentimental about Lagos. Here is my home state. Yeah. You know, you know, I love Lagos. And you should visit. All of you should visit. All of you should visit. Lagos is extremely, yes. extremely fun. If you have the right guides, you have the kind of fun that you will be able to go. You, you'll be, you'll be wishing. You'll be planning your next trip. You know, on your way out. Okay. So, exactly. next question. All right. Um, okay. But I think that I think that that question would depend on two factors. Okay. One is, like I said earlier, if we can draw a direct line, if we can directly map, if we can directly map huge lack, lack of facility, lack of opportunity, lack of infrastructure, if we can directly map it to huge opportunity. That, 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 that tempts me to want to answer that question uh, from a perspective, which area has the greatest need for you know, these digitizations and these recording systems that we're talking about. But then there's another part of me that wants to analyze it based on not just the need, but the readiness of those people to consume technology. And that's where I think I will lean towards my, my country, Nigeria, and my state, Lagos. Lagos is full of data hungry. Nigeria, first of all, you know, has 70% um, of its population below 35. Right, so that's a massive youth population. They are extremely. They watch. They watch. Dear, they watch cable TV. They browse the internet. They are data hungry. So even though they live in a place where, well, by and large, there's a lot of lack of infrastructure, they are very much in tune with what with what's going on around the world. They know the top ten in everything in the US. They know the top ten music and video hits in in, in the US and in Europe and in other places. So. They, they have high expectations of their leaders. And you saw what happened last year with the NCLAS movement. So essentially what I'm saying is they are ready. There's a, there's a, there's a readiness for 
this kind of transformation. If it happens right now, I can assure you that it will be an instant hit, rather than another region of Africa where there may not be that hunger just yet, even though the need is there. All right, thank you. Okay, great. I think, what's the population of Nigeria? Is it 200 million or something? Some a very large number. Technically speaking, nobody knows, but right now the estimate is about 200, about 200 million. Yeah, because last century was about 100, 150, and it's been a few years, so the charts are estimating right now 200. We're due for another census. And it's a, such a diverse country, you know, you have different population from up north of the country to down south, you have, it's like a bridge country. I don't think of Nigeria as a lone country. There, you also have Ghana, you have also Ivory Coast, you have so many countries over there, which are, you know, constantly striving in order to get free because their economies strictly depend on Europe and are strictly connected, not only to the whole continent, but also to China, also to India, UK. Mm -hmm. So think of Echo was the large area over there as a massive opportunity in terms of technology. They're shaping up, uh, Julian, as I told you, I know very well because of my past, of course, being there so many times. Mm -hmm. And also think about what's, north of it you know also shaping up think about morocco think about the rest of the africa that mm -hmm. part of africa is definitely shaping up and the other side of africa eastern africa is also following the same route it's strictly connected to what we were talking about middle east also epic region and, and india as well all these strictly connected that's why blockchain in my opinion fits perfectly and in trade finance, it fits even more. Thank you. Makes sense. Excellent. Anybody else would like, you know, to, to ask something to, to you do, it's the right occasion? Say that again. Sorry? I didn't hear the question, sorry. No, no, no. He's trying to, get, trying to get the audience to see whether anybody else wants to, to, to speak, right? So, uh, but I think, uh, I think we could chat. Right. Yeah, perfect. So we'll see in two weeks time. Thank you, Edu. That was a compelling presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. Um, Thank you, sir. Next hyperledger trade finance sick meeting on 16th of February. Thank you. Okay. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Thank you, dude. It's great, great presentation. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Bye, Kamalish. Yeah, yeah. Hi. So I was listening to all the conversation. Actually, it's a good, good double. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. They're now, they're now safe. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone's saying thank you on the chat. Lots of thank yous. <laughs> All right. You rock. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And there's Mark. No, hey, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Andrea, how are things? You're in the house. Okay. Yeah, sure. Who isn't at house these days? Come on, it's uh, COVID. It's a new office. <laughs> Long term for a year. Uh, I didn't recognize your house, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm here for the year. I think we're here for yeah. another year. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, looking that way. It's looking that way. All right, guys. So, all right. I do. Cheers. Cheers. Take it. <clears throat>